recent research has brought to light war cabinet papers that show again the importance of Southampton as the springboard for D-Day and the liberation of Europe. Although historic England recognised what they described as the prominent role played by Southampton during Operation Overlord in World War II, because this was highly classified at the time, the general population were not aware of the significance of the port during this crucial period. And even today, local residents do not realise the scope of the involvement. These papers reveal a wrangle at a crucial stage between the Army and Navy over two First World War vessels, described in some quarters as rust buckets, at berth 49 in Southampton's eastern dock. Designed to help alleviate the bottlenecks at the channel ports during World War I, conventional ships were loaded with bulky war material that was unloaded after a very short journey by sea. Roll-on, roll-off train ferries were seen as a way around this problem and in 1917 the War Office ordered three vessels despite Admiralty objections. Although the scheduled start of the new service at the military port of Richborough was delayed, operations began between Southampton and Dieppe, with train ferry number one and her sister ships, train ferry number two and train ferry number three. These were the first vessels to offer regular transport between Britain and continental Europe for rail freight vehicles. Following extensive analysis during World War II of possible landing sites for Operation Overlord, the beaches of Normandy were chosen. These allowed for the initial landing of five infantry divisions supported by three airborne divisions on a 50-mile front. Amassing the necessary ships, support craft and aircraft to move this force took some time and following the successful landings, the beachheads had to be sustained and reinforced. The success of the United Nations on the other side of the channel meant that the supplies necessary to maintain them must follow them deeper and deeper into Hitler's Europe. The French railways had been robbed of most of their rolling stock by the Germans during the occupation, and so replacements from Britain and the United States were sent over both as cargo and on ferry boats equipped with a special superstructure to take them. Loading gear designed expressly for the purpose was employed to lift heavy locomotives bodily from the quayside. Once aboard, they were run smoothly into position on the ferry boat's own rail. One most important feature of the shipping of this traffic was the special link span, which worked something in the nature of a drawbridge between ship and shore. By its use, whole trains of goods wagons, Red Cross coaches and other rolling stock were enabled to run straight from the dock rails onto the ferry boats without the use of any lifting gear. The principle of the peacetime Dover to Dunkirk train ferry had been very successfully adapted to Southampton's wartime needs. Thus were the railroads of France replenished with the rolling stock necessary to carry our armies further along their triumphant road to final victory. During the period from the 7th to the 30th of June, 570 Liberty ships, 788 coasters, 905 tank landing ships, 1,442 tank landing craft, 180 troop ships and 372 large infantry landing craft arrived off France. By the beginning of July, ships had transported 861,838 personnel, 157,633 vehicles and 501,834 tons of supplies to France. Yet Montgomery's entry into Brussels on September the 3rd and Patton's US 3rd Army ready to cross the Moselle River on the September the 5th with the possibility of achieving a breakthrough into Germany put pressure on Allied supply lines which led to both the Army and Navy keen to enlist the services of Train Ferry 1 and Train Ferry 3. The sister ship, Train Ferry 2, sent to evacuate the Highland Division at saint valery en cour in 1940 missed a message that the coastal batteries were under enemy control 
and was sunk with the loss of half her crew. On the 24th of June 1940, the two remaining train ferries were taken over by the Royal Navy, who renamed them HMS Iris, later Princess Iris, and HMS Daffodil. Both ships were given a major refit and reconversion to a Thornycroft design and equipped for carrying and launching landing craft via a stern chute. Fourteen could be carried on the car deck and four more could be craned onto the upper deck. In 1942 the ships were compulsory purchased from the LNER by the Royal Navy for £59,000 each. Both vessels were subsequently used to ferry landing craft from builders to operational bases. During Operation Overlord, they ferried damaged landing craft back from the Normandy assault area, but from the beginning of September, both ferries were loaned initially for three months to the Supreme Commander Allied Expeditionary Forces, SHAFE, and were again modified, which included a large gantry and transported cranes, similar to the type fitted to Southern Railway train ferries the Hampton, Twickenham and Shepparton. These modifications were needed to unload railway rolling stock where no fixed facilities were available. The Southern Railway vessels were launched in 1934 and designed to carry rolling stock over the English Channel with four tracks laid in their hulls so they could initially carry 40 goods wagons as well as separate passenger quarters. Like the World War I train ferries, they plied their trade from Southampton but from an alternative jetty in the western docks. Yet it was the older World War I train ferries that were the source of friction between the Army and Navy, which new documents reveal. Correspondence begins with a telegram from Allied Naval Commander Expeditionary Force dated the 15th of October 1944, which refers to a letter of the 8th of October stating firmly that HMS Daffodil and HMS Princess Iris are not an allocation to shape, but were made available by Admiralty to assist in locomotive transportation owing to representations from the Army that there were insufficient other means to ship locomotives to the continent during the phase of rapid post-assault advance. The Allied Naval Commander Expeditionary Force request their return because that they are essential for landing craft transportation for which the Admiralty is responsible and therefore cannot be held up for any further discussion of terms. In a reply dated the 20th of October 44, from Shafe to the Admiralty, they make clear they still need the vessels because Daffodil and Princess Iris, referred to an Admiralty signal, are engaged in movement of locomotives, ambulance trains and other rolling stock from UK. This movement will continue into 1945 and is of utmost importance to supply to the Army's is still restricted by rail limitations. According to the memo of the 20th of October 1944 from Schaaf to the Admiralty, there is no other means of transporting locomotives across the channel. And in an enclosure C for the annex entitled Ways and Means of Executing the Movement of Landing Craft Concern, suggests a number of alternatives open to the Admiralty, including road transport to move landing craft. This leads to the memorandum of the 26th of October in which the first Sea Lord appeals to the War Cabinet and Chiefs of Staff entitled Employment of the LSS HMS Daffodil and HMS Princess Iris in which he states on the 1st of August and the 1st of September respectively the Admiralty lent two LSS HMS Daffodil and HMS Princess Iris to the War Office for use by Shay in carrying locomotives to the continent. As these two ships are urgently required by the Admiralty for the transport of minor landing craft, the loan was made on the understanding that it should be for a period of about three months. The Admiralty are now seeking to call in the loan of these ships, one at the end of October and one in January, but this request is being resisted by Shafe, who considers that the requirement for lifting locomotives is of utmost importance. He ends the memo by stating that in either case it will be necessary to accept a shortfall on the landing craft movement requirements as a whole, which is bound to prejudice future amphibious operations. In the end, a compromise was accepted, although the correspondence goes to reinforce the old maxim that continental wars need continental railways.
sailing from Southampton to Dieppe and Cherbourg, the five ships together, including the Southern Railways, train ferries, Hampton, Twickenham and Shepparton, amongst other rolling stock, landed 2,000 locomotives as well as 40 ambulance trains on the Normandy coast. Today nothing remains of the World War I train ferry berth or the Southern Railway berth in the Western Docks. Until these documents were discovered, the scope and role played by these train ferries during Operation Overlord was not clearly understood. The correspondence goes to show that planners were not prepared mentally or materially to exploit the rapid offensive into Germany. This was not without its consequences as the enemy obtained time to build up their defending forces in the west. Many of the cruise line passengers who dock at Southampton today, some travelling onwards to the Normandy beaches, remain unaware that they are disembarking alongside the same key site that saw the launch of D-Day on the 6th of June 1944. As well as the documents that have come to light, further investigations have revealed that the berth used by HMS Princess Iris and HMS Daffodil is still in situ next to the new ocean terminal. This berth is now the subject of a planning application to protect it for future generations as a tangible reminder of the role of the port of Southampton during World War II.